Thank you. Um, I carry around with me a diary. Um, this object is falling out of fashion very rapidly, as most people now use instead electronic devices. But um, the diary, the, the wall calendar, the desktop calendar, such as the one you, you can see on the screen, are still very popular uh, objects that are, are very commonly used. Um, and in this um, lecture, I would like to argue that these devices are not only useful devices for tracking time, reckoning time, but they are also visual representations of time, of the flow of time. And that these objects can therefore serve as a sort of, or have a certain modeling effect on the way we look at time, the way we conceive time, and we experience it. Visual calendars have an old history. It goes all the way back to antiquity. In this lecture, I would like to trace this history. And I would like to show that um, these visual calendars uh, have been prominent in some cultures, but absent in others. And that will raise the question of why. Now, if we start from um, ancient Egypt, we find that um, very few uh, documents, very few texts from ancient Egypt can actually qualify as calendars, um, representing, in fact, calendars. This one here in front of you is, a, is quite an old one. It's called the Ebus calendar. It's not really a calendar. Um, as we'll see in a minute, I'll just show you the, the translation of this text. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, so um, the document is written uh, right to left. The translation is left to right. So uh, just bear that in mind. Um, you can see that it's a neatly laid out text. Um, the bullet points represent ditto signs. So it's a way of the scribe avoiding to repeat himself. Um, so rising of Sothis, and then the same thing here, and so on. But it also has a certain visual effect, and it makes the, the page easy to look at. The middle column is where the names of the months are listed, so third month of Shemu, fourth month of Shemu, first month of Achet, second month of Achet, and so on. It's not a full calendar of the year, it's really only a list of the ninth day of each month. And then the column on the right uh, perhaps uh, indicates the names of the lunar months. Uh, it's not entirely clear what this document is meant for. It certainly is not a representation of the calendar of the year, but it still gives us a general impression of what this calendar is. Um, very much later uh, in the Roman period, the mid second century CE, uh, we have this um, document, um, which again is neatly laid out. I know it's very damaged and uh, perhaps difficult to see, but um, this, this, all this here is, is, is quite neatly laid out and neatly structured. Um, again, it's not a full calendar of the year. Um, all it is really is a scheme, a set of data to enable uh, the calculation of a full 25-year cycle. Moving over now to um, Mesopotamia, um, here we have um, uh, something like a calendar known as a calendar of lucky, day, lucky days, um, also um, neatly neatly structured. Um, there is um, a box for every month. Um, but um, in each of these boxes, you don't have a full listing of the days of the month, only of the favorable, propitious days. So for example, month of Nisan, day one, day four, that's only half a day. That presumably means that the other half is not so good. Um, 
6, 9, 10, and so on. So you don't have a full calendar of the year, but at least you have a representation of some of the significant days of the year. And it is reasonably structured. It all appears on one tablet. Um, this one here, um, um, this one here actually gives every single day of the year. So perhaps it is a, a, a full calendar in the full sense of the term. Uh, and each day is represented with a lot of information for each, uh, each one. So uh, every, box, uh, every box is actually a day of the year. And it contains lots of information such as um, cultic and medical prescriptions, um, omens, pr uh, predictions for the day, uh, and so on. Um, but although each day is neatly placed in a separate box, um, the months uh, run into each other. Um, it's not as if each month begins at the top of a page, as it were, but it's sort of, it's a running text. It's a continuous text, which goes on uh, through uh, six tablets. So the visual effect really is lost. You can't, by looking at these tablets, you don't get a sense of where the month is, where the year is. It is really a text to be read uh, or to be listened to or to be memorized. It doesn't really have the visual effect of um, uh, a calendar in the sense that we, uh, we understand it. The first um, fully um, visual calendars uh, to appear in history, uh, calendars which represent all days of the year and which can be seen at a glance in a sort of structured layout, uh, come from the Hellenistic world, and these calendars are relatively late. So you have in front of you here um, an astronomical, a Greek astronomical calendar known as Parapegma, late second century BCE, which is um, uh, relatively late compared to the other sources we've looked at. Um, this stone um, represents basically all the days of the year, um, each day uh, represented by um, a hole. And the way, yes, the holes, holes along here, and the way it worked was that um, uh, you would have a peg that you inserted in the hole, and every day you moved the peg along the holes, and that would enable you to keep uh, track of, of the days of the year. Now, this is not a, um, it's not a civil calendar. It doesn't represent the months of the year um, the way they would have been reckoned. It is an astronomical calendar. It gives you astronomical uh, information for each day of the year. Um, so um, the, the text surrounded in red is what you have in transcription in Greek here at the bottom and the English translation here. So uh, uh, in this day, the sun enters the sign of Aquarius. The next day, Leo begins to set in the morning and Lyra sets. And then you have two days where nothing happens. There is nothing particular to report, but they're still indicated on the stone so that you can move along your peg and not lose track. Uh, the next one, the bird Cygnus begins to set chronically, and then you have a whole string of days where nothing happens. So in this way, all the days of the year are there, even if they don't all have uh, any information associated with them. But the, the first calendar in history, which is a graphic representation of the civil calendar of the year, comes from Rome and is later still. This is from 84, between 84 and 55 BCE the first Roman uh, calendar uh, that is attested. Um, it, is, uh, the, it, it comes in the form of a, um, um, a public, a monumental public inscription. Uh, and uh, it contains uh, in one piece um, the whole of the Roman calendar laid out in columns. So each column is a month, uh, January, February, March, April, May, and so on. At the bottom of the column, you have an indication of the number of days in the month. 29 days in January, um, 29 days in February, 31 days in March. This is not the calendar we have. It's the, the Roman calendar before it was um, reformed by Julius Caesar, 
before the uh, institution of the Julian calendar. The days of the month are not numbered, but instead um, we have um, um, essentially um, two columns. One column, which is um, uh, letters numbering A, B, C, D until F, so that's eight, and then A starts all over again. So it's an eight-day cycle. It's perhaps the ancestor of the seven-day week. Uh, and then in the next column, we have indications of the quality of the day, whether it is um, a propitious day or uh, an impropitious day, uh, whether you can conduct a business on it uh, or not. And then finally, uh, there are uh, indications, um, Lupe Calia, for example, indications of uh, Roman festivals, uh, his Saturnalia, uh, uh, various festivals, uh, important public festivals um, of the year. Now, after the, the Roman calendar was uh, changed and the Julian calendar was adopted, uh, similar monumental uh, inscriptions go up with now the Julian calendar, which is basically the calendar that we are, uh, we are still using today. Um, and the, the inscription, this is only a fragment of it, uh, follows the same model, but there are a few additional items. So here you have the, the sequence of days uh, from A to H, um, the, the H day cycle. Here you have um, um, uh, letters indicating the quality of the day, um, also uh, names of uh, festivals. But you'll note here in between that now uh, you have actually a numbering. So the, the days of the month are numbered. And also, interestingly, here on the right, you have an extensive commentary uh, giving lots of information about some of the days of the year. And this kind of um, calendar became very widespread in Italy uh, during this period in the early part uh, of the first century. The concept of a um, monumental calendar which you display um, in a very well-structured manner uh, spread to the provinces of the Roman Empire. Here you have uh, a similar type of calendar from Gaul. Uh, it's a public monumental inscription. Uh, it is laid out as a table, month by month. The days of the month are numbered. Um, the character of the day is indicated. There are references to the various festivals. But the big difference between this calendar and the other ones we were looking at is that it's not a Roman calendar. This is a Gallic calendar, a Celtic um, calendar, uh, essentially. And it is also a lunar calendar. It is based on the phases of the moon. So um, this uh, monumental inscription from the second century C, uh, CE uh, must be looked at as an expression of Gallic identity, um, which works through an appropriation of a Roman tradition, uh, which could be interpreted as politically subversive. Um, more complex uh, calendars emerge towards the late of antiquity, the end of antiquity. This is. Um, a document known uh, as a hemorologion, which appears uh, in various late antique manuscripts. Um, the, the way this table works is that on the column in, on the left, you've got the Julian calendar, which is the calendar that we are uh, uh, accustomed to. Um, uh, this is then for the month of January. And then all the other calendars in this table represent other provincial calendars that were in use in the Roman Empire. Uh, and this document um, is presumably there to enable one to convert dates from one calendar to the other, which of course would have been very useful for traders and um, provincial administrators in the Roman Empire. But also at the same time, this document represents in a certain way how all the calendars of the Roman Empire can be reduced to a common denominator. And this common denominator is the Roman imperial calendar, the Julian calendar. So there is an underlying imperialist um, statement, if you want, in a document of this kind. In the meanwhile, um, the tradition of, um, of uh, calendar tables continues uh, in Roman culture. This is uh, from a manuscript that originally would have been written 
in 354. It contains, uh, again, the same sort of information as we saw uh, earlier on, um, but uh, additional items have been added. So uh, here we've got the um, uh, eight-day cycle, but in this column we have a seven-day cycle. So the seven days have been added. And on the right we have a scheme for calculating lunar dates. Um, and uh, on the, the right-hand side, we still have uh, the Roman pagan festivals, even though officially by now the Roman Empire has converted to Christianity. And this calendar was most likely composed by a Christian, but uh, the shape of the calendar is such that it still has to uh, be made of uh, the pagan festivals, and this is then what appears uh, here. So um, highlighted, you've got the Saturnalia, on the 25th of December, it's not Christmas, but it is the festival of the Invincible Sun, Sol Invictus. In the Middle Ages, um, the same model is going to be preserved, but now instead of Roman pagan festivals, there are Christian festivals instead, uh, and in particular, um, Saint Days. And they are here in this column. Uh, this is um, a calendar that was composed in Durham in the 12th century. But apart from the fact that you have festivals and uh, Christian festivals and saint days, in other respects, this is very similar to the calendars you find in the Roman period. And what I'm trying to stress then is that you have here a continuous tradition running from the Republican, Roman Republican calendar table that we first saw, all the way through to the liturgical Christian calendars of the medieval period. Here's uh, another one um, nicely ornated from um, the 14th century. Um, so it's really the same structure as always, and you have here um, the, the numbered days of the month in this column, in this column, you have the seven-day week cycle. Um, some additional information here for working out lunar dates. And here you have uh, the saint days. So Christmas is somewhere down here. Here it is, actually. Uh, and there is also a bit of additional information. Um, Sol in Capricorno, that means that the sun is entering the sign of Capricorn. So this is astrological, astronomical um, information. This is a very magnificent, very famous uh, liturgical calendar. And the author of this calendar has been able to find a saint day for every day of the year. So now there aren't any gaps, but this column is completely full. OK, and there is some additional stuff here, but I'll move on because um, I'm conscious of time. Um, so um, basically, this is then um, the tradition, the Roman tradition of calendars, which goes all the way through to the Middle Ages, and which, I dare say, is also the ancestor of the own our own calendars that we have today, and that we place on our walls and on our desks. But um, if we go back to antiquity, uh, and we now consider an entirely different tradition, which is uh, the Jewish tradition, we find there uh, a rather different situation. Um, on the screen, you have a, uh, a table representing the calendar that was found uh, in texts from the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, which dates to the second uh, to first centuries BCE. Uh, the calendar of the Dead Sea Scrolls is a very simple, very well-structured calendar. Every day, um, every new year begins on the same day of the week, on Wednesday. Every day of the year occurs on the same day of the week. And it's so simple that the whole calendar of the year can be represented on the single table, which is here in front of you. Um, this is another diagram, another table um, representing Dead Sea Scrolls calendars. A little bit more complex because this one integrates also a lunar calendar. But um, nevertheless, it can be represented very neatly as a table. But the important, important point um, I would like to make 
is that this table and the one we saw previously, this one, these two tables um, are basically constructions by modern scholars. This is what modern scholars have created in order for a modern reader like us to grasp how um, the calendar of the Dead Sea Scroll works. But in the sources themselves, in the actual scrolls themselves, what we find is very different. It is not at all a table. Um, it is actually prose. It's text in prose, in words, which is written in a continuous manner. So uh, I'll just give you an example of um, a translation of, a, of one of these documents. But what you have is, in the first month of the fourth day, it is Sabbath. On the 8th, it is the Feast of Investiture. On the 11th, Sabbath. On the 14th, Passover, third day of the week. On the 15th, Feast of Anvil Bread, and so on. It is a continuous text in prose, um, which is actually very difficult to grasp. I mean, you, want, you have to read through it, and you don't really get, by looking at the text, you don't really get the immediate sense of what the calendar is, in the same way as you would when you, do, uh, when you look at a, uh, at a Roman calendar, for example. Uh, that we saw um, before. So um, basically, um, the, the visual simplicity um, of, this, of, of, of the calendar is completely lost. And um, as late as the, the 13th century, Jewish calendars are still being written as a continuous text and not uh, in any way as a table. So this then is a document from Germany, late 13th century, and the text reads uh, like this. Um, New Year on Tuesday, fast of Gedalia on Thursday. On the Sabbath, fifth of the month, a certain portion of Deuteronomy is read. Yom Kippur is on Thursday, etc., etc. So it's, it's a text which is really very heavy to read, and there is absolutely no um, visual effect here whatsoever. It is only in the 14th century that... Um, calendar tables in Hebrew begin to appear. Uh, here is one example. And so the interesting thing about these first tables in Hebrew is that it's not of the Jewish calendar, but it's actually a Christian liturgical calendar which has been translated into Hebrew, uh, including all of the items. These are saint days translated into uh, Hebrew uh, or transliterated into Hebrew letters. Um, and um, you can see right away that the, the Hebrew calendar has been modeled on existing liturgical calendars which are in Latin. So it is very much a replication of the same principle. Uh, Jewish, a Jewish calendar uh, in the form of a table only emerges much, much later in the, the, the 17th or 18th century, even. This is an early uh, 18th century. And for the first time here, you have um, uh, a Jewish calendar presented uh, as, uh, as a table in the form that we would expect a calendar to be presented. This is quite an interesting one because it contains the Jewish calendar on one side and corresponding uh, Christian or, um, uh, or secular calendar uh, on the other. This is another example. Uh, what we want is this box over here. It's a Jewish pocket calendar published in London in the late... Um, 18th century. So um, basically what we've seen so far is considerable variety from one culture to the next um, uh, in, um, in, in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, ancient Egypt. Time is barely visualized. We saw things which are a little bit like a calendar, but they're not really the equivalent of a full calendar. In Greece, in Rome, in medieval Christendom, time is, by contrast, visualized in many ways. The parapigmata, those are the, the peg holes, yes, the stone with the peg holes. The monumental fasti, those are the big Roman uh, uh, displayed uh, calendars. The hemorologia, those are the multicolon calendars of provincial, uh, provin uh, uh, tables of provincial calendars in the empire. And then the liturgical calendars, which become very prominent in the Middle Ages. And then when you go to the Jews, uh, again, by contrast, time is not visualized at all. Uh, calendars are written out in continuous prose, and there is no visual effect. So um, um, in the rest of this lecture, I would like to try and explore reasons why perhaps 
there are such differences between these various cultural, historical traditions. Um, and broadly, what I'd like to say is that visual, uh, visualized time uh, has to be interpret, uh, interpreted in relation to a broader cultural context, and it can only be understood in relation to it. Um, so, um, um, first of all, that um, visualized time can serve as a political instrument of publicity and propaganda, which will only apply in some cultures and not in others, and uh, that visible time um, has something to do with a more general concept of time and of worldview. It's time which is spatialized, reified, deified. Reified means that it's turned into a thing, deified that it's turned into a god. But I'll explain all this in more detail in turn. So first of all, uh, time as a political instrument. So we've already seen um, uh, this calendar before. And um, we are told by the, Greek, uh, the Roman historian Livy that um, the first calendar of this type was posted um, in 304 BCE. I don't know if we need to believe this, but this is what Livy tells us. But the interesting thing is that he says that the purpose of posting this calendar was that it be known that legal action, or when legal action, was permissible. And the one who initiated this was Gnaeus Flavius, um, a politician who was trying to uh, broaden the Roman Republic and to draw in more people into the political scene and make it a bit more inclusive. So part of his inclusive policies is to uh, make the calendar publicly known. So there is a, a political purpose in displaying this calendar. Um, the next item which we've seen again, uh, this is the Julian calendar, which is very prominently displayed in the age of Augustus. Uh, through the peninsula of Italy. There is clearly a political uh, propaganda game being played over here, which is that Augustus is trying to promote the calendar that his adoptive father, Julius Caesar, instituted, and to declare in this way that the new calendar is, uh, marks the beginning of a new political era uh, for the city of Rome. Uh, here we have the Gallic calendar, which, as I mentioned before, uh, has a certain element of political subversiveness to it, that is playing the game of the Roman calendar, but in a, Greek Celt in a Gallic Celtic way. And finally, uh, the Hemorologia, which, as I said before, is some sort of statement about imperial cohesion uh, within, uh, within the Roman Empire. So um, all these political uh, functions uh, which we see emerging in these different calendars are specific to Rome, to the Roman Republic, to the Roman Empire, uh, and it is perhaps no surprising, therefore, that calendars of this type uh, might be absent, or, not, or are actually absent, in Egypt, in Mesopotamia, uh, and indeed in Jewish tradition. And um, finally now we move on to uh, this uh, part of my argument, which is that um, the display of calendars has something to do with a concept of time which is visual, which is spatialized, which is reified, turned into something real, uh, deified, turned into a god. Uh, here is the example of a time god from an entirely different tradition. Shiva is riding the god Kala. I'm not sure if he is a god. I don't know enough about Hinduism to to be able to confirm exactly what's going on here. But it's interesting that Kala, eternal time, is conceived here as a sort of vehicle. Uh, the interesting concept of time, the time, the vehicle that is carrying the gods or carrying, uh, carrying the world, perhaps, even. But um, uh, as I say, I don't know much about this. But moving back to the Roman Empire, here we have a very fine um, personification of time in the form of the god Kronos. Um, there are various indications that this is um, what the, the image represents. Um, the snake uh, is a symbol of time, as we have uh, in the quote, which is at the bottom, Kronos the serpent. Um, uh, he is inside an egg-shape form, uh, an egg-shape, an egg uh, sorry, which um, is associated with time. Time, uh, according to various traditions, created a primordial egg out of which the world was uh, then created. You also have the 12 signs of the zodiac all around him. 
So uh, this then is an image of the God's time. God's time is attested also very well in, um, in uh, Greek and Roman literature. Um, moving on um, to um, the early modern period, I should have also said that um, there is no God of time in ancient Egypt or in Mesopotamia. Yes, the God of time is something Greek, something Latin, something Roman. Uh, so that's why you have images of time gods in Rome. Um, sorry, yes, I'm, I'm moving on here to um, the early modern period where we have an allegory of time. Of course, at this point, he's no longer treated as a god, but still time is an entity uh, that can be visually represented. Uh, in the 19th century, it becomes very fashionable to draw world historical timelines. Um, here is an image of time um, as a river, uh, a very interesting metaphor uh, also. Uh, uh, this is another one where time is perhaps intended to convey the idea of a road. Uh, and then, uh, in 1909, uh, the mathematician um, Hermann um, Minkowski suggests that time could be viewed as a fourth dimension, after the three dimensions of space, and that this fourth dimension of time can then be spatially represented in the form of a graph or the, a diagram. Um, the, the concept of time as a fourth dimension uh, has caught on in public imagination, but it fits in very well with the traditional uh, Western uh, culture, which goes all the way back to Greek and Roman antiquity, where time is spatialized and reified, turned into some sort of real entity. And uh, this uh, attitude finds expression even very recently in a book which came out a few years ago on uh, cartographies of time, which is all about these timelines. And there the authors cite something at the beginning which reads, and I quote, the fact is that spatial form is the perceptual basis of our notion of time, that we literally cannot tell time without the mediation of space. That is what the authors of this book claim. Now, of course, this claim is, is completely wrong. <laughs> it's completely absurd to say that you can't conceive of time without mediation of space. There are lots of ways that we experience time, which have nothing to do with spatialization of space. But I still find it very interesting that um, a scholar writing in 2010 can write, can make this sort of statement with a straight face, because it indicates something about the pervading culture that we live in. It is a culture where we do associate time very much with a more spatialized um, notion. And this, um, I want to suggest, uh, is reinforced by the tradition of the calendar table where time is represented in two dimensions uh, and placed on the wall uh, for something that, we, something that we can look at, something that we can see. So, uh, to conclude, and uh, this will be followed by a bit of time for questions, um, what have we seen? We have seen that calendars, diaries, timelines are time reckoning devices, but they are also visual representations of time and therefore, in a certain way, uh, a certain conceptualization of what time is. We have also seen that visual calendars are a continuous tradition running from ancient Greece and Rome, I should say perhaps mainly uh, Rome. It's in Rome really that these calendars um, really develop and become an important part of culture. And it's a tradition that runs from ancient Rome through the Middle Ages all the way to the modern period. And yet this uh, culture is more or less entirely absent in ancient Egypt, in Mesopotamia, and in Jewish tradition. We have also spoken about the cultural context of visualized time. We've tried to explain how perhaps um, the profile of where you do find calendar tables, where you don't, can be related to the broader culture within which uh, these calendars are found. Uh, we spoke about uh, visible time as a political instrument for publicity, for propaganda, for perhaps uh, more subversive agendas. 
this is very uh, prominent in the context of the Roman Empire, and this accounts to a large extent for the Roman uh, calendar tradition. And we have also spoken about um, visible time and worldview, uh, and I've suggested that visual calendars, such as diaries, um, wall calendars, and so on, belong to cultures where time tends to be spatialized, reified, and sometimes even deified. So today is the 22nd of January, and this is the end of my lecture. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Stern, for a fantastic talk. We do have some more time, um, if, there are any, like, if there are any questions. If you do have a question, just wait for a microphone to come to you so people watching online can hear. There's one over here. Could you tell us why the Christian calendar was translated into Hebrew? Why the Christian calendar was? Translated into Hebrew. That's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, the, the reason, there, there are several reasons, and some of them may have something to do with an interest by Jews in, in Christian calendars, an interest in translating it and explaining it. But the, the most important reason why these calendars were translated into Hebrew is that Jews, of course, lived in a Christian society. And in medieval Christian society, the liturgical calendar was the way time was reckoned. Uh, in fact, if you wanted to date an event, you usually wouldn't say um, the 6th of January. You would say Epiphany. Uh, or if you want, you had an event on the 22nd of, of December, you would say three days before Christmas. So everything was dated in relation to the liturgical religious life of Christian society. And the Jews who had to do business with Christians had to know how this calendar worked. And it's for that reason that they translate uh, into Hebrew. They have to know when market days take place. Market days very often... Uh, were correlated with saint days or with festivals. Um, so for all these reasons, Jews had to, had to know how the Christian calendar worked. There's a question right behind you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you showed us Kronos and showed us how that related to the representations, the spa spatial representations of time. I was wondering if Kairos was ever represented in the same way. I'm thinking along the lines of us, um, the Mesopotamian example where there were special days that sort of were good days that you could do certain activities on. So was Kairos ever represented spatially in a similar way? Yeah, uh, you're talking about Mesopotamia specifically then? No, I was just using the example of how Mesopotamia isolated, because of course Kairos is seizing a, a, a specific moment, right? And I was just thinking the, the Mesopotamian example showed us how you might want to seize a favorable day. In the Greek or even Roman example then, do they ever represent Cairo spatially that you would want to seize a certain day, that there's a moment to be seized upon in the same way that they're representing Kronos? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit different actually. Um, they, they do things a bit differently. The concept of favorable days, unfavorable days um, exists in quite a few cultures. You've got it in Mesopotamia, you have it in in Rome, and you have it in the Gallic calendar that we saw. But everything has to be adjusted to the local culture. What exactly is the meaning of favorable and unfavorable is a, is a whole question which is not properly understood. And um, the texts that we saw, the Mesopotamian texts that we saw, um, are not really calendars, but they're really lists of days, and they, they provide lots of information about each day. Whereas on the Roman calendar, everything is much, much more telegraphic, if you want, symbolic. It's just one letter, if you want, and nothing more, because there's no space for it. And because the, 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 the main uh, purpose of the Roman calendar is to be able to present everything visually in one shot, which you don't get in the Mesopotamian tablets. Right, but it is... Is, is Kairos ever represented, then, spatially? Is? Kairos. Uh, the, the, uh, the opportune moment, the, the um, alternative to Kronos. Oh, oh um, yeah. Um, you, you, oh, I see what you mean. You, you want to draw a distinction between Kairos, the Greek word Kairos, and the Greek word 
Kronos. Kronos. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, that's the whole subject in itself. I think it's a little bit outside the scope of this sure, lecture. Sure, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Kronos is a word for appropriate time. Yeah. And Kronos is a word for time. Yes. But words for time, I think, vary uh, greatly when you go from one language to the other, and the nuances are quite complex. Um, I don't think it'd be possible to answer this just in sure. one line. Fine. Okay, yeah. thank you. Well, I am conscious of time, as hopefully everyone is slightly more conscious of time now than they were an hour ago. And that is unfortunately all we have time for today. But if you could uh, join me in thanking Professor Sutter.